Well, you're probably, or well, I don't know, you may be wondering, why has it taken so long to get to the Bible <laughs> um, on a series um, of catechesis and preparation for confirmation? You might think, well, isn't that the first thing you start with? Well, I'm going to suggest it's a bit more complicated than that, and um, the sort of method in, in the madness. So this morning we're going to look um, at the Bible and the relationship of the Bible and the church, um, how we might understand the Bible, is it the Word of God, um, and then just to think about a couple of approaches to how we might read um, the Bible. Um, and what I want to do first is use um, the prayer, which in fact was the collect for this morning, um, which in the Book of Common Prayer always came in the second Sunday, I think, of Advent. Um, but it's a wonderful prayer about giving thanks for the scriptures and thinking about how we might make them our own. And it uses, as you'll hear, very physical language. So listen out for it and I'll pick some of these themes up later. So let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, help us so to hear them, to read, mark, learn and inwardly digest them, that through patience and the comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and forever hold fast the hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. So that prayer speaks of us hearing the scriptures, of reading them, of marking, i.e. making notes, uh, drawing our attention back to key phrases, learning them, and then inwardly digesting them. Um, I've spared you my um, assembly trick that usually works um, for, well, it probably work for all ages actually. Where I say inwardly digest, that means we have to eat it. And of course, I theatrically tear out a page of my Bible and start eating it. Of course, it's rice paper, <laughs> so it's digestible. Uh, but it sort of makes the point that, that there's a physical relationship uh, with the Bible. And that's where it's good to have your own copy of the Bible. And if it gets worn out, then set it aside and get a new one. Bibles aren't meant to remain immaculate with all their lovely gold print on the spine and not a page out of place. They should be worked and worn. And of course, many of us with our smartphones now will have the Bible um, on the phone. So once or twice, I, I've got my phone out and I've thought, are people thinking I'm on the phone here? When of course, actually, I, I am honestly scrolling through to find a verse. And now, very good. Uh, some of these Bible apps helping you locate the verse um, that you think, I wonder where that phrase comes from. Um, so I would commend those, but also I'm old fashioned enough perhaps to think a book actually is, is where we ought to be as well. Well thumbed, that's a good sign. Now there's an, another old question what came first, the chicken or the egg? Toby's got an answer. This, this is one <laughs> I haven't come up with yet. Far away. Right, it's the egg. Lovely, it's the egg. So who laid the egg? Good question. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> so, the question, what came first, the chicken or the egg, is one that when you start answering it, you think, oh, hang on, but something must have come just before that to make that possible. So, yeah, so you could have said the chicken, and I'd have said... And which egg did the chicken hatch from? That would have been um, the question. So what came first? The Bible or the church? I want to tell, I mean, it's a slightly detailed story, but there's um, a vicar of Croydon in 1534 called Roland Phillips. And Roland Phillips was a great friend of St Thomas More and St John Fisher. And this was at the height of the Reformation. And people were saying, which side is Philip's on, this vicar of Croydon? Because he was an important man. Is he on the side of the Reformation and the importance of the Bible, or is he on the side of the um, Catholics and the importance of the Church? A lot rode on Roland Philip's 
answer to the question because he was hauled up in front of the then Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, and I would guess it may even have been in the old palace um, over the way. And he was asked um, whether the apostles preached to the Gentiles that which the apostles wrote. Phillips replied, the evangelists wrote that which the apostles had preached. Now you might be thinking, what? <laughs> what are they on about there? I don't, I don't get that at all. Really the question is, what came first, the Bible or the church? Did the apostles go to their Bible and then start preaching? Or did the apostles, the, the early church, start preaching and then these things were being written down? in the New Testament. Like chickens and eggs, it's really hard to unravel. And I think that's what Roman Phillips in his um, answer was getting at, although I think everyone knew he inclined to saying it was the church that came first and then the scriptures, the New Testament, was captured as they began preaching. So that's a, a bit of a knotty one, but it, it's an important one because it also reminds us, when we read the Bible, we're not reading it entirely alone. We're reading it within the context of the church, within the context of the Christian community. And we'll come back uh, to that point um, a bit later on. You see, the main thing is that if we read it alone and don't listen to what anyone else has ever interpreted about the scriptures, it becomes so privatised that we can impose our own meaning on the Bible, and we think, great, everything I think, it's all there, and I would point perhaps to some of our cousins in the United States, where there are examples of that sort of interpretation where things have gone really badly wrong, actually. There is a flip side to that, which we'll come back to. The other thing is, people will say, well, how, how have we got the books that we've got in the Bible? All those books in the Old Testament and all those books in the New Testament, who decided? Well, again, that's where the church, the, the body of believers, uh, came in. And um, very early on, there was someone called Marcion, who is um, named as a heretic, so didn't get things spot on, to say the least. And Marcion, um, in a sense, saw the, the list of books of the Bible more as a menu for him to choose which ones he found more appealing and which ones he didn't. Um, and you might agree with his choice, actually. It was basically the bits where God seemed nicer in the Old Testament and where Jesus seemed nice as well. I'm completely over caricaturing there. But there were bits Marcion didn't like, and he said, I don't like those bits. However, the bishops, the early church fathers, said, no, we have to accept the books that we've received, some of which don't make it in, but we discern that together. And we trust, inspired by the Holy Spirit, what was known as the canon of Scripture came into being. So, broadly speaking, the books we recognise today, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And there's another set of books, often known as the deuterocanonical books, so the second canon, sometimes also known as the Apocrypha, the hidden books, um, which in the Church of England, um, we don't put on the same level as the Old and New Testament, but say they're important and they're inspired. Um, so there are sort of three types of scripture within the canon. So we've got the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, and of course, they're the scriptures Jesus knew. When Jesus is quoting from scripture, he's not quoting from the Gospel according to St. Mark. That hadn't been written. Um, he wasn't quoting St. Paul's letter. St. Paul um, wasn't even a Christian at that point. Um, he's talking about the Hebrew scriptures. So they become definitive and important for us. And then, of course, the New Testament is the account of who Jesus is, that proclamation of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in the four Gospels, and then the letters, um, which are the um, letters, pastoral letters, that also have great doctrinal bearing 
uh, for us. So really important um, Christian texts. So when you look at the Bible, you might think of it as one book. And of course, actually, it's lots of books. And they all come from different eras. Um, and probably the ones right at the front of the book aren't the oldest texts. Um, so the dating of the books is different. The Gospels were written at different times. And indeed, the genres, this is a, a word I know loved at schools now, there are different genres. So some of them are history, some of them are poetry, um, some of them are prophecy, some of them are gospel, some of them are letters. And of course, when you read them, you're reading them in different ways. Because if you read a cookery book as if it's a novel nowadays, it's going to be quite a dull novel. But if you've got a, a Pride and Prejudice off the shelf and thought, now I want to cook my supper, you've got the wrong book for the wrong occasion. Likewise, with the scriptures, there were different books addressing different things in different styles and genres. Is the Bible the word of God? Well, I suppose the next question is, what do you mean by the word of God? But I just want to explore three standpoints, perhaps. I think you could believe from certain atheists that the Bible is more like a science textbook or um, a handbook that Christians take absolutely, literally, word for word, every day. But actually we know the Bible isn't a science textbook. It's not an astrophysics handbook. Um, it's speaking, for example, when we talk about the creation, it's talking about the meaning of creation more than it's talking about the means of creation, how the creation actually happened. So don't get sucked into the argument with someone saying, ah, oh, but you take it literally. Actually, we don't. We're, we, God gave us brains as well, and we use them as we digest what scripture is about. You might also think from some humanists that the Bible's got quite a, a lot of good advice. Um, for example, do unto others as you would have them do to you. That's good, but humanists then would go and say, but that, all that religious stuff, that's, that's a bit weird. It sort of gets in the way. But of course, for Christians, we'd want to say, yes, there is a lot of good advice in the Bible. Um, but it's more than that because it comes from God. It's not generated from ourselves. It's, it's a gift to us. And that's why we cherish uh, the Bible. Interestingly, too, in Islam, Muslims would say that Christians are the people of the book, along with uh, Jews. We're defined as people of the book. And we're respected um, for that. Although... It's worth saying that there's a good quote from Archbishop Michael Ramsey, another Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, but he was Archbishop in the 1960s and early 70s. And he says, despite the exalted place of the Bible in all forms of Christianity, the really important place of the Bible, Christianity is not the religion of a book, but the religion of a person, Jesus Christ, himself described as the word of God. So our first relationship is with Jesus Christ, not with a text. However important that text is, that text always reflects Jesus to us. That's at the heart of what we're about as Christians. So unlike, again, Muslims would say the Quran is received direct from heaven as it is um, inviolate, can't even be translated because it, then it's not really the text. The Bible isn't understood like that for us, and indeed the Bible is one of the most translated um, books, I think, ever, and it's certainly still the world's uh, bestseller. Um, the Bible, then, is our holy scriptures, not just an interesting old text to be studied, or a handbook that governs every moment of life, because if it was, then I think most of us wouldn't have any eyes left. Um, because if we've ever looked at somebody in a, oh, that's a rotten 
nice looking person way, uh, literally we should pluck our eye out because it's caused us to sin. I think we've all got two sets of eyes, but we may know in our hearts that we haven't always behaved in the way um, that that text is trying to tell us. And when we read the Bible, because it's Holy Scripture, sometimes we'll be challenged, sometimes we'll be comforted. So I want to end with um, two methods of uh, reading the Bible. I started at the time of the Reformation when the Bible, because it's so precious, and its preciousness, if you like, got really raised and its profile raised. Um, and there was a sort of image of the way to read the Bible is to sit there reading the book and the individual interpreting it. And that was almost as a balance from the times when the Bible was denied most people to read it. A, they, most people couldn't read. And B, they couldn't afford books. And so they were hearing from bishops, priests, um, and others what they were to believe. So the Reformation said, you can read it yourself. You could say, perhaps went a bit too far to say it's your own personal, private interpretation that matters, and it's important to hold it somewhere in between. Also, there are lots of ways that people study the Bible now um, as if it was a bit of literature, and that can be really helpful, really insightful, but of course it's Holy Scripture, it's more than just um, a book to have some literary criticism uh, done to it. Um, if you start pulling verses out there and what's that word and oh it appears 28 times in this passage that sort of robs it of its beauty it's like taking a rose and pulling all the petals off and saying ah this is one of 48 petals on this rose the rose has lost its beauty when you start dismembering it so too you could argue with the Bible so there are two methods I just want to put to you and I know some people here are familiar um, with well, everyone's here familiar with one, and some are familiar with the other. So the first one I want to talk about briefly is called Lectio Divina. Lectio Divina simply means holy reading or divine reading. It's a method of reading the Bible slowly and deliberately. You could call it deep reading. And you might just take a verse and, as our prayer began, just chew it over. Read it and chew it over. The Latin word for this bit of the process is ruminatio, which you might recognise as the word ruminate. And cows ruminate when they chew the cud. They, they eat the grass and then they sit there sort of all day. That's all they seem to do, cows, as far as I can tell. Just chew, chew, chew. And as you know, they've got lots of stomachs. So the grass goes into the stomach and then it comes back out as cud and it gets chewed over again to extract more goodness that you couldn't get the first time. You need to break it down to extract more goodness. Same with reading the Bible. There are verses that we might have heard a hundred, a thousand times that can hit us afresh when we spend time with them, chew over them again. And that's, in a nutshell, the method of Lectio Divina, just taking small, bite-sized passages of Scripture and chewing over them and noticing what's this saying to me. Not what did somebody else say about it, what did Elaine say in his sermon, Father Andrew say in his sermon. No, what's being spoken to me here and now? And that can change depending on our context in life. And that moves on into praying uh, with the Scriptures as well. And then the last thing to say is what you could call the liturgical con context, i.e. how we hear the Bible in church. Um, here we're given the text of the scriptures, and that's great, we can follow them. Sometimes just try listening, because you hear things in different ways when you're not following the text. To sort of play around with that, experiment with that. Also, in the Minster Bulletin, there should be the readings for next week. So why not make it your discipline, and it is a discipline, to say, before I come to church next Sunday, I will have read the readings, or at least one of the readings. And if it's just one, I'd suggest read the Gospel reading. So that when you hear it, it's got more chance of landing well with you. 
bit like the parable of the sower, you know, the seed lands in, in different places. In some places it hasn't got a chance. If it lands on the path that's trodden on all the time and hard, how's it ever going to get its roots in it? Of course it's going to be taken away. But if you can be if you like, tilling the field of your heart, when that word, the seed of the word lands in you, it's got more chance to grow and be fruitful. There's a wonderful phrase in Psalm 119. Thy word is a lantern unto my feet, the light upon my path. I hope as we grow in our love of the scriptures that our way is indeed illuminated, that it's like a lantern uh, to guide us and lead us. And I hope in Lectio Divina, thinking about how you prepare for hearing the Bible being read in church, I hope it becomes more of a lamp um, for you as well. Lovely. Oh, okay. <laughs> that happens every time. <laughs> Any questions, responses, thoughts that you want to share about the Bible, your use of it, um, any other ways you might suggest to people is a good way of approaching the Bible. Steve. There were so many different translations. Reading the same thing in particular for the Psalms in different words. All in a sense trying to say the same thing, but saying it differently, can really help understand or uh, get into what what it's trying to say. Yeah. Because modern English and 17th century English aren't the same, but then all sorts of different modern Englishes aren't the same either. That's a really helpful point, and, it, and it's worth reiterating. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew. The New Testament is written in Greek. And unless you speak ancient Hebrew, or uh, what's known as Koine Greek of around um, Jesus' time, you can't read it in the original. You have to do a lot of study to get to that point. Thanks be to God, we have translations. However, as Stephen absolutely rightly illustrates, um, we translate things in different ways. And if we had Sophie here uh, talking about French, she would bring another dimension to that um, as well. What I, I think I would say is I think it's good to use different translations. Um, the one used in church at the, the principal service is the New Revised Standard Version, and that's pretty standard across the Church of England, but not the only one. But it, it is worth having or getting another modern English version because you get different perspectives. It's like looking at the same diamond, as it were, but from different uh, views. There is also, um, it's not really a translation, it's a paraphrase, a book called The Message, which a lot of people find useful. There are some pitfalls to that because it's not the Bible, it's not a translation, but it can be very helpful, especially in some of those quite dense passages. I remember a church I served in, there was a lovely woman, and she would only read from the authorised version of 1611. She said, it's the glory of English literature. And it was, I mean, it, it is, it's wonderful. Um, but there are some bits that are practically incomprehensible to the modern ear. And she used to read it beautifully, and I said, Barbara, how do you do, you know, you do read it beautifully. Yeah. She said, um, Oh, well, I usually read it from the Good News Bible first, and that was a version written with a very limited vocabulary so that it could be well understood by lots of people. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. The rest of us have to listen to you reading in this version, but you go off to the Good News Bible, um, effectively a children's Bible, so that you can understand it first. So I think it's very good uh, discipline. And it may be an older version, because there, there is an absolute beauty in those words. Um, but bring in a, a modern version as well and read the two alongside each other. Especially if you're finding it hard going. You think, what's this about? I don't understand. You won't be the first person to thought that, I promise. Pam? Yeah, I was just thinking, sort of taking a step back from what Stephen said, there's also um, reading it with that sort of socio-political mind of why was this gospel or passage or whatever written, what was going on at the time, what provoked the writers to write that. Yeah. Because that can kind of enrich sometimes your yes. understanding of it and, and 
it, it's sort of another side of that. I think that's a very good point. The, so the socio-political, what, why did they write this down? I think the first one we have to assume is they wrote it down because they want to tell others about Jesus Christ and who he is. What you really notice on the socio-political question is the different emphasis, for example, in the four Gospels. So um, I was preaching on Luke uh, at Evensong last week. Luke is very interested in healing, very interested in people who at the time, and I think still today, are deemed at the fringes of society. When you learn that Luke was a physician, a doctor, you think, ah, that might explain a bit why he's interested so much in him. He's brought something of his humanity to this gospel. It doesn't change or dilute the message of Jesus. It brings in a new perspective. Likewise, um, the author of Revelation, almost certainly socio-politically, is writing at a time of huge persecution of Christians. Uh, so what he wants to emphasise is we will be vindicated at the end of time. Um, the vision of heaven. Um, we will endure sufferings now in order that we um, find a place in, in the eternal Jerusalem. Um, so those different perspectives have been really helpful in modern literary criticism, um, be it socio-political or economic circumstances, and some really interesting studies on that. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, that, that's good to know that you've done that. I think that also um, illustrates that there are lots of very good, and some slightly dubious ones as well, but um, books of commentaries. And a, a Bible commentary really is, uh, some of them go almost word by word um, detail. Some of them are a bit more overarching, and usually those are perhaps a bit more helpful rather than just get lost and can't see the wood for the trees. Um, but to have a good Bible commentary, um, and, and there are certainly a range from, um, one of the good ones is Tom Wright, for example, um, a retired Anglican bishop and biblical scholar, very good set of um, commentaries. Um, and then there are more academic ones, uh, more accessible ones as well. And, and sometimes people use um, daily Bible reading notes and it might take you through a book and with little reflections on the passage. So it may not be going into detail, but it might use something to illustrate uh, what's going on. Um, and if that's something that interests you, that's something you can uh, get hold of. I'm, I'm, are there people who use those? Yeah, do you promise? But Bible Reading Fellowship. The Bible Reading Fellowship, yes, that's New, it. Yeah. New Day Daylight and Guidelines. So, New Daylight and Guidelines. Um, so, New yes, New that will... Day, New Daylight is a piece of text and then a short commentary underneath. And Guidelines goes in more depth. It will be a piece of the Bible you have to read to get the Bible out to read yes. it. And then there'll be a commentary. Yeah, so different levels of how much detail, how much sort of ease do you want, um, in a sense. And of course, one of the things, and we're going to do it again this Advent, um, that we did during the lockdowns in Lent and Advent, and in the period of time before, between Ascension and Pentecost, was uh, we had daily videos going out that I know a lot of people appreciated, just sort of two minutes of a, a Bible verse, which almost was... Then here's the one you can chew over now uh, for the rest of the day and, and, and ruminate. Chew the cud. Imagine yourself being very content, fat cows sitting in the field. Actually, don't imagine that. <laughs> We're all human beings, not cows. <laughs> oh, that was a nice moo. <laughs> Any final uh, questions or thoughts that anyone wants to share? Just a, a question actually. How yeah. do you reconcile the conflict between the way different branches of the Anglican, Methodist, 
so the newer churches interpret the Bible? That is an excellent question, and <laughs> part of me thinks, oh, we're just running out of time. Because <laughs> um, in a way that gets to the heart of the matter o over a lot of issues that churches disagree on. We assume it's the issue churches are disagreeing on. Often, I think, it's the method of how we interpret scripture. Um, so there will be some things, the area of sexuality would be a, a classic one, um, that there is a, a literal reading of something, um, which other churches might say, but you can't read it literally like that. You need to look at this wider context, scriptural and uh, bringing to bear our own pastoral care and concern. That would be one. But likewise, um, what happens to us when we die? Um, that there's, there's the notion of the rapture that some churches talk about um, that, that appears to have a biblical basis but that no other church had spotted until quite late on. So there are lots of different readings of scripture and I suppose because we don't say that the Bible dropped out of heaven and here it is, that's it. We've been given this sort of burden or task or joy of interpreting scripture and working towards the truth with it. And it's really interesting that in St John's Gospel, of course, we're reminded, uh, the author says, and there are so many other things that Jesus did. If I kept writing, the world wouldn't be big enough for all the books. What are those things? How do we know about those? And that's where, where I suppose my basic answer is I would res absolutely respect the interpretations of others. I would trust that the Holy Spirit is moving in those interpretations and that people are genuinely open to what Scripture is saying to them rather than them saying this is what it should be saying. So the, the uh, classic distinction, exegesis, is a reading of Scripture and seeing what you bring out of it. Eisegesis is the approach of saying this is what I want to see and I'm going to find it and I'm going to keep looking until I find it. That's when we bring our own agenda and that's not of God. That might sound a bit of a woolly one, but I, I suppose that's where I'm going to start on that. Whoa, we've covered an awful lot of ground there. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. And for those people who are on half term this week, enjoy um, your half term. And um, see you next week when we'll be thinking about the saints. Thank you all. Go well.